Hello, everybody. It's Philip Lee returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. Um, if you want to subscribe to future editions, then click the subscriber button below and also the notification bell in the upper right. Today, I'm going to talk about the Battle of Liberty Place in New Orleans. I covered this about a week or two ago with a video, but I'm going to race that one and do this one because I did not cover the, the post-battle election that happened in uh, the autumn of 1874. And I wanna include that to, to finish the story. So I'm gonna replace it with this one. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, get started and uh, pull up my notes. Although commonly portrayed as one of the largest mob attacks on blacks by white races during reconstruction, the so-called 1874 Battle of Liberty Place in New Orleans was really a conflict between the militias of two competing state governments. The story begins in 1868 with the election of carpetbagger Henry Warmoth as Louisiana's first elected Republican governor. To ensure future Republican victories at the polls, in 1870, his legislature established a five-man election returning board, which had final authority to, de to determine the outcome of all major elections. It is perhaps the most egregious example of how Recon Reconstruction era Republican puppet regimes use control of the election machinery to force their will on the people. At the end of Warmoth's four-year term the, in 1872, the state's Republican party split for two reasons. First was an internecine fight over, this, over the distribution of political patronage within the state. Second, was a consequence of a split in the national party between the stalwarts and the liberals. The stalwarts black backed President Ulysses Grant, whereas the liberals wanted civil service reform to, minim to minimize patronage corruption. Nationally, the Democrats joined the Republican liberals in backing as their presidential candidate, Horace Greeley. Similarly, in Louisiana, Henry Warmus liberal Republicans backed Democrat John McHenry for governor and his running mate, David Penn. The state's stalwart ticket, that's the grant-oriented ticket, consisted of William Kellogg for governor and Caesar Antoine as his running mate. The Kellogg team was known as the Custom House faction because Kellogg was previously the tariff collector for the Port of New Orleans. Moreover, the then-present collector was James Casey, a brother-in-law to President Grant. During the 19th century, customs collectors produced most of the federal tax revenue and were notoriously corrupt. The election took place on the 4th of November, 1872, when Warmoth convened the returning board to certify the winner on the 13th of November, he was dismayed to learn that Kellogg representatives challenged the board membership. Through a torturous series of court cases, Kellogg felt he had the authority to set up his own returning board. The result was two opposing boards. One, managed by Warmoth, supported McHenry. The second, managed by state senator John Lynch, supported Kellogg. Since Lynch's board had no ballots to count, they created vote tally they created vote tallies out of thin air. Lynch got the results Kellogg wanted by using as, quote, returns, affidavits, newspaper estimates, and even their own calculations from general knowledge of what a vote in each parish might have been. Predictably, on December 4th, Warmoth's board announced McHenry the winner. And two days later, Lynch's board declared Kellogg the winner. The true winner will never be known. There was fraud on each side, especially Kellogg's. Even though Warmoth held the state's election machinery, the Kellogg fashion controlled the federal election supervisory machinery under the new KKK Enforcement Acts. They named numerous supervisors in every parish and deployed 600 special marshals in, Louis in New Orleans alone. Affidavits made by black voters who were allegedly denied the vote were printed in blank by the thousands before the election and signed in bulk by obliging officers. The special marshals engaged 
to complete them had only to dig up names from any convenient source and fill in the blanks. Lynch's board counted each fraudulent affidavit as a vote for Kellogg. On December 5th, federal judge Henry Durrell ordered U.S. Marshals to seize the State House, then in New Orleans. The following day, federal troops only allowed Kellogg men to enter the offices. In response, McHenry's Democrats set up their own state government at the Lyceum Hall in the New Orleans uh, Municipal Building. For the next 10 months, Louisiana would have two state governments, one propped up by federal marshals and soldiers and the other supported mostly by the state's white voters, although there were some blacks. Two years after his December 1872 ruling, the Republican controlled House Judiciary Committee in Washington voted to impeach Ju Judge Durrell for systematic bribery and for exceeding his authority in the 1872 elections. He resigned before the full house drew up impeachment articles. Louisianans soon realized they were confronted with two competing state governments, each expecting taxpayer support. Thus taxpayers could not know which government should be paid when the tax bills arrived. When each government selected a new US Senator, the problem got kicked up to the Senate in Washington because that body would have to choose between the state's two new designees, thereby indirectly validating one of the legislatures and nullifying the other. Although today's student might suppose that the GOP controlled Senate in Washington would choose the Republican candidate, it did not. As the senators researched the election, they were appalled at the manipulations and refused to seat either Louisiana designee into the U.S. Senate. Thus, the U.S. Senate concluded that Louisiana should hold new elections, a decision that caused riots between the two sides back in Louisiana. That forced President Grant to make a choice, even though the president and his cabinet agreed that Kellogg was, quote, a first class cuss, close quote, Grant chose to back him, perhaps because the president's brother-in-law profited uh, by being a member of the Kellogg team. Eventually, the two state governments formed their own militias. Kellogg's was composed of blacks and the New Orleans police, while McHenry's was composed mostly of white volunteers from organizations such as the White Leagues. It was those two forces that clashed at Liberty Place in September 1874. Neither was a disorganized mob. Unlike the Ku Klux Klan, the White Leagues were not secretive. In some parishes, they did little more than hold anti-Kellogg public meetings. In others, such as New Orleans, the chapter's 3,000 members were well-drilled and militant. Their leaders explained that the movement was, quote, an inevitable result of that formidable oath-bound and blindly Republican obedient Union League of Blacks, close quote. In July, 1874, Kellogg passed a bill that gave the governor even more power to dictate election results by empowering him to appoint, without appeal, all agents authorized to register voters. By September, conditions had reached a boiling point. The state's economy had long been dismal. Property values had dropped by two thirds during the preceding six years. Apparently only Louisianans affiliated with the Kellogg administration and their allied tariff collectors prospered. Rumors that Kellogg intended to confiscate firearms in New Orleans and since the city's white league Tempers were short and Kellogg abandoned the state house for the granite fortress of the customs house. In McHenry's absence, his Lieutenant Governor, David Penn, activated their militia. The two militias clashed at four o'clock on the afternoon of the 14th of September. Although Kellogg's force was led by former Confederate General James Longstreet, his men were defeated within about 15 minutes. About 30 combined participants on both sides 
were killed. Consequently, from his bunker in the Customs House, Kellogg wired Grant for federal troops. When the soldiers arrived three days later, McHenry's militia disbanded peacefully. Although Louisianans did not vote for a governor in 1874, they did elect a new legislature. Kellogg's control of the ballot counting predictably resulted in the majority of Republican legislators. When Democrats challenged disputed seats during the swearing in process, Kellogg called forth the US Army again, this time to seat only those candidates that his returning board had authorized and to forcibly remove any challengers. In short, Louisiana's 1874 elections were another Republican controlled fraud that created a phony Republican majority in the legislature. That time, however, many more Northerners and even some Republicans criticized the situation. Not only was it increasingly evident that the Republican returning boards would never permit honest elections, but discipline over dissenting Southerners was becoming increasingly tyrannical. After a hurried and secret summons to New Orleans, General Philip Sheridan suggested that the federal government classify any Southerners suspected of physically resisting carpetbagger governments as bandits, thereby making them subject to arrest and trial under military regulations as opposed to civil standards. In response, the New York Tribune pointed out that if Grant could use the army to select his preferred legislatures in Louisiana, he might one day use it to select those he would allow Congress to seat. Republican Senator Carl Schurz explained that many political leaders were asking, quote, if this can be done in Louisiana and sustained by Congress, how long will it be before it is done in Massachusetts or Ohio, close quote. Republican Congressman and future President James A. Garfield observed, this is the darkest day for the future of the Republican Party that I have ever seen. Close quote. Public mass meetings against Republican totalitarianism, tot public mass meetings against Republican totalitarianism in Louisiana were held in such cities as New York, Cincinnati, and even Boston. The legislatures of Ohio and Pennsylvania officially condemned the federal military, quote, invasion, close quote, of Louisiana. Even the president's cabinet was divided, but those siding with Kellogg, such as War Secretary Belknap, Navy Secretary Robeson, and Attorney General Williams would all later resign under clouds of other scandals and corruption. A House investigating subsequent, a House of Representatives investigating sub, subcommittee composed of two Republicans and one Democrat that was present in Louisiana during the 1874 elections concluded that the elections were peaceable and fair. That what fraud occurred was mostly on the Republican side due to their control of the election machinery. It even determined that the Democrats had won most of the seats in the legislature, but had been denied the majority by, quote, arbitrary, unjust, and illegal, quote, methods exercised by the returning board. The subcommittee characterized the Kellogg government as a usurpation. Similarly, Northern journalist Charles Nordhoff added that by 1874, quote, all white men and many blacks, close quote, detested Kellogg's government. In March 1875, New York Republican Congressman William Wheeler negotiated a compromise under which Louisiana Republicans conceded the State House of Representatives to the Democrats in exchange for a promise from the latter not to impeach Kellogg. When President Grant's successor removed the federal soldiers in 1877, Louisiana's carpet bag government collapsed for good. So that's the, uh, the full story of the Battle of Liberty Place in New Orleans in 1874. What I'd like to do now is to share something on the screen with you that, um, let me pull it up here. 
Okay, this is um, uh, the cover of my book, U.S. Grant's Failed Presidency. And if you want to understand uh, Reconstruction in the South, uh, this book is, uh, is going to help you. Um, Grant's, presidency was, Grant's, presidency was, Grant's presidency was not only corrupt, it was a, a failure in terms of the opportunities it had to bring the country together and to uh, develop a uh, sound foundation for Reconstruction. Now, if you want to get copies from Barnes and Noble or Amazon or bookstores, I think they're twenty. They are twenty dollars, and you can just get them. You know, go online. You can buy them there. If you'd like an autograph copy, you can get an autograph copy directly from me. Uh, just email me, Phil P H I L underscore Lee L E I G H at me m e dot com. Okay, I'll stop sharing the screen here, and now I'm back. And uh, that's our show for today. And thanks for watching.